Good afternoon. I would like to welcome everyone to today's Academy of Political Science Forum. I'd like to welcome members of the Academy and other invited um, guests and, mem and members of the audience. Uh, this is very exciting for us here at the Academy to continue our series of uh, Academy, Academy forums. Uh, today, today's event is, is new. That is, these forums typically deal with topics of current interest or the latest articles in the journal Political Science Quarterly. My name is Bob Shapiro. I'm president of the Academy of Political Science and also editor of Political Science Quarterly. Uh, today, it's, it's very exciting. We're having our, our first session that showcases a new major book and also a review article that, that was done um, on the book. And for today's program, I wanna turn the floor over to our moderator, Mary Elena Mantis, who will introduce uh, the participants in today's forum. Um, Mary Elena Mantis is associate editor and managing editor of Political Science Quarterly, and also a lecturer in the Department of Government at Sacred Heart University. Dr. Mantis. Thank you, Professor Shapiro. Welcome everyone. Um, it's a pleasure to be here with all of you today. As Professor Shapiro noted, this forum seeks to put in conversation the author of a review article published in Political Science Quarterly and the authors of the book that inspired that very that review article. Um, I would like to introduce our panelists, uh, Professor Mina Bose, welcome. She's the Executive Dean for Public Policy and Public Service Programs and Director of Presidential Studies at Hofstra University. She's also a member of Political Science Quarterly's Editorial Advisory Board. Her review article entitled, How Can Presidents in the Executive Branch Preserve and Protect American Democracy? was published in the spring 2022 issue of Political Science Quarterly. Welcome, Professor Bo. Also with us are the three authors who inspired that very um, article that I mentioned. Um, Professor Stephen Skolonek, he is the um, Pelatea Parrott Professor of Political Science and Professor in the Institution for Social and Policy Studies at Yale University. Professor John Beardsworth is an Assistant Professor of Political Science and by Carolyn P. and Robert and Rogers Dean's Faculty Fellow at Vanderbilt University. Professor Desmond King is the Andrew W. Mellon Professor of American Government at the University of Oxford and a Fellow of, of um, Newfield College in Oxford. Together, they are the authors of Phantoms of uh, Villagers Republic, The Deep State and the Unitary Executive, published by Oxford University Press in 2021. Welcome everyone. It's a pleasure to have you with us. We're very excited um, that you accepted our invitation to participate in this forum. And we all look forward to um, the next hour of wonderful, enticing conversation. Um, we will begin with a, a discussion of the book offered by the authors, and that will be followed by discussion and comments by Professor Bose. Members of our audience will have an opportunity to enter questions. Um, you will see at the bottom of your screen a questions and answers box. Please feel free to enter your questions in that box and uh, our panelists will have an opportunity to answer those questions towards the end of our event. Um, we could begin. Well, thank you uh, for having us. We're looking forward to the discussion of our recent book, uh, Phantoms of a Beleaguered Republic. I thought I would just say a few things about the motivation for the project and uh, uh, review some of the main ideas uh, that we were working with in the book. Uh, I should say that when we began this project, uh, the notion had taken hold that Donald Trump was not a normal president, that his presidency was, as Joe Biden said, an aberration. That line of thinking seemed to us wrongheaded. It made it too easy to bracket Trump and to diminish the significance of his presidency. As we see it, presidents are homegrown products of our political system. There are no aliens. We wanted to re-examine the governing arrangements that made Trumpism possible because those arrangements are likely to be with us long into the future. <clears throat> 
We focused our attention on two conjectures which became commonplace during the Trump years. The first, the deep state. The other, the unitary executive. Both of these are extrapolations from the notoriously complicated design of American government. We call them phantom twins because they haunt the shadows of the constitution and draw each other out from its ambiguities. Much had been written about each of these concepts individually, but little had been said about the intimate connections between them. As we see it, the Trump presidency made those connections clear. When we say that the deep state and the unitary executive are phantoms, we don't mean to imply that there's nothing of substance behind them at all. The American state is deep. Our book is in part a rumination on the depth of the American state and the values that depth underwrites. Values like competence, expertise, constancy, confidence, knowledge, skill in administration. As for the notion of the unitary executive, that one, that's an idea as old as the constitution itself. It draws support from the constitutional separation of powers, and in particular from the opening of clause of Article II, vesting the executive power in the president. But again, the devil is in the interaction between these two features. Willful insistence on an executive branch unified and hierarchically controlled by the president is bound to provoke resistance from administrative operatives, not least because Congress has endowed the executive branch with considerable depth and provided administrators with formidable resources with which to fend off rule by fiat. On the other hand, administrative resistance to presidential control is just as certain to elicit outrage from the chief executive, sharpening claims on behalf of administrative subordination and executive branch unity under presidential direction. These confrontations played out at several different sites during Trump's term. Our book examines Trump's efforts to strip away the various manifestations of depth that he encountered. Depth in staff, depth in norms, depth in knowledge, depth in appointment, and depth in oversight. Contest over these, contests over these various manifestations of depth rocked the Trump presidency. We saw them play out in conflicts between Trump and the White House advisors over trade. We saw them in disputes between the president the FBI and the Department of Justice and the Russia investigation. We saw them in the friction between Trump and scientific advisors at the EPA and during the pandemic. We saw them in the president's extensive use of acting officials, officials he said would give him more flexibility. And we saw them in Congress's first impeachment of the president in the UK Ukraine affair. The issues raised in these confrontations reflect a conundrum lodged in the structure of the Constitution itself. They're ingrained in the tensions between the separation of powers on one hand and checks and balances on the other. We show that until recently, novel extra constitutional contrivances kept these phantom twins submerged. These innovations accommodated a more political and popular role for the president and national leadership. And in so doing, they pushed ever farther afield of the original idea of the president as an officer detached from popular enthusiasms and operating safely above the fray. And yet at each of those, each of those rearrangements, acknowledging a more politicized presidency also conspicuously relaxed the separation of powers and provided stronger provisions for interbranch collaboration in control of the executive branch. Early on, presidential control was mediated through the organs of a sprawling decentralized party system. Later, reformers deepened the state itself, institutionalizing the presidency and insulating administrative offices afforded an additional hedge against the evolution of presidential populism and the threat of unilateral impositions above. The pattern since the 1970s has been quite different, however. 
as local party organizations lost their grip on the presidency, candidates for office were freer to mobilize political followings of their own and to bring those personal presidents, those personal parties directly into the White House. At the same time, a new formalism took hold, stiffening the separation of powers, and with it, presidential claims to exclusive control over the executive branch. This we submit is an odd arrangement. Unlike the framers' original scheme for separating powers, this new arrangement promotes the politicization of the executive branch. And unlike the latter day improvisations designed to deal with a more politicized presidency, the current arrangements are hostile to power sharing. So the elements in this scheme may be familiar, but their combination is novel. Joining a politicized presidency with a stark separation of powers produces uniquely divisive and volatile results. Our basic claim is that the Trump presidency expressed the dynamics inherent in this new arrangement more fully than ever before. Trump showed us the strong affinity between insistence on a unitary executive and the rise of personal parties. He also showed us how that amalgam amplifies tensions between the president and the executive branch, how they fuel presidential efforts to strip away administrative depth. Many portrayed Trump's efforts to deconstruct the executive branch as an assault on the fundamentals of good government. What troubled us, however, was that Trump could claim that he was the one who was upholding the fundamentals of good government. After all, he pressed his assault on the deep state as a matter of constitutional authority and popular will. Emboldened by those pretensions, Trump showed us the unitary executive in practice. As we see it, the meaning of that idea was revealed in its active deployment in the pursuit of power. The deep state charge sharpened the political edges of the unitary claim. It weaponized its largely formal constitutional argumentation. When Trump stigmatized protections for administrative depth as impediments to the will of the people who had elected him, he joined a constitutional claim to singular authority in the executive branch to a political mandate and plebiscitary prerogative. The effect was to transform the constitution into a vehicle for promoting precisely what is originally designed to prevent. Formalism was used to advance a personal, populist, charismatic presidency. The notion that the constitution resists power of that kind was met with a characteristic response from Trump's mobilized base. Get over it, they said. Elections have consequences. Well, let me bring these remarks to a close with a few, a couple of takeaway points. The first is a caution against placing faith in another president to fix things up. Trump's idiosyncrasies made it easy to personalize these issues, to bracket them, and to look to Joe Biden to set things straight. Clearly, Biden took that cue. His good government message was full of promises of self-restraint. But note that this approach, self-restraint, is every bit as personal as Trump's. And in that regard, it deflects attention from the more fundamental questions raised by Trumpism. The focus now should be on whether and to what extent presidents should have discretion in these matters. Is deference to science or respect for prosecutorial independence something the president should be allowed to decide for themselves, something they provide or not in whatever way seems politically expedient to them. Choosing the Biden brand in search of relief for the Trump brand concedes far too much to presidentialism. This is what comes from thinking about the problem of Trump as personal. It's not personal, it's institutional. It's always been institutional. Good character and well-intentioned overtures will only take us so far toward a resolution. A second lesson is that there's only so much we'll be able to take away from the Constitution by way of guidance. Advocates of the unitary executive call for a return to the original arrangement. To that end, they've riveted our attention on Article II's vesting clause. But there's no going back to the framers' arrangement. 
the current debate over whether the framers intended to give the president all the executive power is a red herring. When the framers separated powers, when the constitution separated powers, I should say, it vested the executive power in an officer who would only be obliquely connected to a popular following. In the original arrangement, popular leadership was to be held at bay. The selection system was designed to counter the threat of a politicized presidency. It was designed to bind the president more closely to the national interest and his duty to faithfully execute the law. Keeping faith with the constitution after the collapse of that solution and the rise of popular leadership has always been a matter of improvising alternative arrangements. If there's one point that's not in dispute, it's that the framers of the constitution were determined to prevent the executive power from becoming the strong arm of the president's personal party. Those who want to retrieve something of the original intent now had best begin there, for now we've seen the framers' nightmare become reality. The selection system has changed radically since the vesting clause was written, and that makes any abrupt return to the so-called plain words of the vesting clause misleading, if not downright to toxic. In effect, it puts the fundamentals of presidential democracy in America at cross purposes. Trump's, Trump exposed this mismatch, but again, the problem presented was not personal, it was institutional. Trumpism invokes the framers words to justify the takeover of administration by a politicized presidency. After a long, long history of expanding presidential power through pragmatic power sharing arrangements, this new arrangement cuts out collaboration and captures all the executive power for the president. This then is our third takeaway. We recommend breaking our current preoccupation with Article 2 and focusing attention once again on the institutions that surround the presidency, in particular on the organization of our political parties, the configuration of the selection system, and on a reinvigoration of cooperative systems of administrative management. Therein lies the hope for yet another reconfiguration, one that can address the dysfunctions exposed in the current one and restore a sense of collective responsibility. Well, thanks again uh, for having us. We look forward to questions about this. We look forward especially to Mina's comments. We'd be happy to talk about in more depth about the cases that we uh, talk about in the book, uh, but also about our thoughts in this new expanded edition, uh, which takes up the Trump-Biden transition. Thank you very much, Professor Saranek. Um, a reminder to our audience that this will be the time to uh, use the question and answer box at the bottom of your screen to start entering your questions. And we are moving on to the next part of our discussion. And Professor Bose, we welcome your comments. Thank you, Mary Lena. And uh, thank you to Political Science Quarterly, uh, Bob, uh, in particular for hosting this roundtable. Um, it is um, writing book reviews and review essays is fun. And I'm often left with the uh, sentiment that I should follow up with the authors about this question. And yet uh, that rarely happens um, frequently because there's uh, such a time lag between uh, when you complete the review and when you actually see the authors again. And so many things have come up. Um, so I appreciate this opportunity um, to engage um, with my colleagues. Um, Steve Skronik, Desmond King, John Dearborn about this, what I think is really one of the most important books um, in political science that I've seen um, in the past few years. And so I'm, um, and I think has very important implications. In fact, you've probably anticipated all of my questions in your expanded edition, but nevertheless, let me uh, let me share some, uh, some thoughts here. Um, and again, th I appreciate the opportunity for this forum. And I, I hope, I think this is a, a very important template uh, going forward in our, in our discipline. Um, rather than summarize the points in my review essay, I wanted to, raise three issues uh, that I would very much like to discuss uh, with the authors and uh, perhaps the audience will be interested as well. The first one is, it's a very small point, but as I was preparing for this event, 
I was struggling with the title, um, the word phantoms in particular. And I, I probably spent way too much time looking up the distinction between phantoms and ghosts and trying to think of something else. I thought, well, you know, what does it mean by phantom? An image that's not quite accurate, um, but, but you know, something that was present, um, but is now gone. And I thought, is that really what describes the deep state and the unitary executive. Um, and I, I, I kept trying to think of better words. I, I came up with visions, um, but that didn't seem quite right. And that's that term is used a lot for discussing kind of modern presidential leadership, thought of shadows uh, kind of in the background of the framing of the constitution, illusions, caricatures didn't seem scholarly enough. So I, I'm kind of left with, I, I couldn't really find um, a better substitute, but it wasn't clear to me that these concepts are really dueling phantoms. And I, I was just curious as to, I, I think um, the book explains very nicely how these concepts are used, but I didn't, how they've kind of overshadowed American politics, at least from the late 18th century, let's say from George Washington onward, if not from the constitutional debates in 1787. But I wasn't quite sure if that was, although I liked the title, I, I was struggling with how to explain it to a non-political science audience. And, and maybe that's not the charge, but that was, that was one concept I, I would welcome hearing from the authors on that. Getting to the substance, one of the, um, one of the most rewarding aspects of this book is that it takes two underlying institutional concepts about presidential deep state and unitary executive or um, to kind of cast them more broadly political responsiveness and executive power and demonstrates how the tension between these constructs is endemic to American politics. Um, I was actually very excited when Political Science Quarterly invited me to review this book because I thought, well, then I get the book right away so I can read it. And I noticed that it was very compactly written. So I thought, well, this will be, you know, a pleasure and easy to do. In fact, I must tell the authors and this book, I used the word dense in my review. And I did not mean that. I, I really wrestled with that because I don't mean that in a negative way. It, this is This book is really so richly developed. And I see how it came out of conversations from, I believe, 2019, um, when Steve was on leave initially, right? Um, and, uh, and then this developed from a conference into a book. Um, I really found myself rereading not just chapters or sections, but sentences to decide where I wanted to focus. And, um, and as much as I was able to address in the review essay, I really wanted to devote more time to engaging the analyses of staff, of knowledge in particular, and appointments. And so I really, um, I commend the authors for, for really making every sentence in this book count. And it's one that I would, uh, I would recommend that, um, that uh, people not just read, but reread, because there is, it's, um, like I said, I think it, it addresses underlying debates in American politics and really presents a path forward for studying those concepts. Um, uh, like I, I was late grading because I ended up rereading it so many times before writing my review. Um, and I think that the, the conflict between presidential power and democratic responsiveness um, illustrates well uh, what, what Steve just summarized, that this is not personal, it's institutional. That said, I do want to raise a, a, a question about that. Um, and I guess maybe I'll, I'll bring it to, rather than kind of going through and, and repeating Steve's kind of very succinct summary of this rich analysis, I'll focus now on where I wanted as pleased as I was that it was succinct, where I wanted more. And um, and 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 perhaps this is the basis for discussion. I'm, I'm not sure that this is really what the expanded edition does, but perhaps the three of you can um, uh, 
can provide insights as to where we go where we go from here um, is really, and that was kind of the last section of my um, review essay. How do we address these endemic challenges in American democracy? The book discusses the need for structural reform. And Steve summarized very nicely the idea of restoring um, collective, uh, collective responsibility right, discuss the, that we can't rely on constitutional change or on presidential responsibility, the Hamilton Federal Assembly alone, that we need to see really a rebuilding in American politics. Um, in the book, uh, in the last chapter, the authors say that solutions have always been informal and extra constitutional. And I'm, I, I wanted to know more about what that entails in the 21st century. Um, you know, I hesitate to go from conceptual to kind of the very kind of nuts and bolts of what do we do, but but I really think um, I hesitate to use the word crossroads. It's been used many times in American politics. It came up in 2000 in the 2008 presidential election. It came up in 2016. This was. It came up during the Trump presidency and that was before the COVID pandemic. But it's a fair assessment that American democracy is truly at a crossroads today. And as we look at congressional primaries, midterm elections, the next presidential election, there are underlying questions of legitimacy and governance. And I am I struggled at the end of this book to, to identify what structure, what institutional reforms are needed. Um, certainly, and I know from the other research scholarship that all three of you have published, I can see some directions for this with presidential selection, with party leadership, and then potentially going into specifics with appointments and oversight and staffing. But I'm still at a loss to, to, to identify how we reconcile the merits of presidential power and a deep state, not as pejorative as a descriptive, right? The need for admi the administrative state with polarization, heightened kind of hyper-federalism, if you will, today in American politics, and, um, and the challenge of knowledge and legitimacy. I guess I, I, guess I would leave it at, at those four, polarization, hyperfederalism, knowledge, and legitimacy. And that brings me to a last concluding question. Um, there have been other reviews of this book that raise the question of whether perhaps the book overstates the institutional challenge and understates the personal um, case study of the Trump presidency. Without a doubt, I believe the authors have demonstrated clearly that this tension between executive power and democratic accountability and responsibility has numerous precedents in American politics, from the progressive movement to the uh, new federalism in the Nixon administration, the efforts to um, ad administrative reform in the 1990s. We can kind of keep going and going, particularly post 9-11, the, uh, the new architecture in national security policy, but to combat terrorism. But without a doubt, the norms, knowledge, oversight were challenged like in the Trump administration as in no other presidency before. I, I, I think that's a fair point. And um, some scholars have written that it is, um, that perhaps the, by the focus on the institutional reform 
by doing that misses the challenge of how to overcome the ruptures, the disruption, the upheaval of the previous presidency. And so I would, um, I, I think that that combined with the in questions about institutional reform are really important um, next steps in this analysis. And, and I'm kind of hoping the authors will publish an article that I can assign in an undergraduate class to discuss this because I, I think more so than ever before, the question of the stability of American political institutions is being questioned. And, and when I see undergraduates who are not political science majors asking about this, the, the kind of keen interest we have in American politics today, um, it's clear this is something that scholars have to address. And so um, I welcome more research and scholarship from the authors and, um, and commend them on this very uh, timely and important uh, analysis. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Bose, for those uh, extensive comments and also uh, for raising questions that um, I look forward to hearing, to which I look forward to hearing responses. Um, I think you've walked away from this book with more questions than answers, uh, but I think that is an indication of wonderful scholarship and that is why we're here and very excited that we have the opportunity to put you all in the same screen, if not the same space, um, to engage and um, try to answer those questions. Um, I open it up to the authors. Feel free to um, engage with each one of those questions in whatever order you think um, makes the most sense. Thank you. Will I just say something, John? Or go ahead. Okay, just first. Um, thank you so much for your for your comments now. Um, Mina and and for the the review, I, I the the review was was very gratifying, um, not not just because you were you were complimentary about the book because you seem to really get its um, purpose and um, intensity, and as you say, it's it's dense in a good sense that we try to pack a lot in and to um, unpack key concepts, staff knowledge and so forth and expertise, and of course the it's it's about the state which is a topic um, Stephen has written on a great deal. So this is, I think, a, uh, a valuable extension of that. Um, I wanted to pick up on just a couple of your points and then colleagues will answer, particularly the, towards the end and, and this issue of institutional reform versus personal um, uh, power and whether, whether it's enough to just focus on the institutional rather than the the, um, to think about who might occupy the office. And there are at least, I mean, there are a lot, that opens up a lot of issues, but two in particular, I think are quite important. I, I think we, we do want to stick with the claim that um, the system is institutionally creaking and the three um, uh, Republican remedies that um, uh, were in Stephen's slide sort of get at this to some extent, and particularly where we are now since the 1970s. And, and into that institutional uh, fragility um, it came a norm breaker. And I think this is very important. Somebody who did not respect norms. And um, we know now from public administration and political science, not just in the US, but comparatively, and it feeds right into this literature about democratic backsliding and the fading of democracy across um, many countries that um, we rely on, we as citizens rely on norms and states rely on the um, compliance with norms as a key aspect of legitimacy. So rather than having to try to spell everything out, there are, there are just norms that have evolved and are, and are accepted. Um, and what we've discovered, I think, is, is how vulnerable those, norm, those norms are to being um, uh, challenged and violated and subverted. Um, and that makes the institutional system's um, uh, fragility more exposed and problematic. And I think that's one of the things we're, we're finding, all kinds of things, basic things like appearing before Congress when you're called, um, uh, respecting the way of appointments, being, uh, being assuming that um, uh, people appointed to professional roles in, in, the, in the state, in the bureaucracy, have got um, a competence which should be respected. Uh, and not and not belittled, and that you 
don't sort of start a war with your own experts, particularly in the middle of a pandemic. But all of that got junked uh, at, with, with heavy costs. Um, and that's that particular um, uh, period we've been through with, those, with, with the Trump presidency, but it only makes sense to think about this historically and, and what the institutional structures look like. And from that point of view, we're, we're, we're saying, and I, I, I think persuasively, that um, you, you need these valuable dimensions of the state that you highlight, you know, the appointment of top staff, respect for expertise, a, a proper appointments process and so forth. Um, and the politicization of the civil service towards the end was, was of the Trump presidency was something that was very um, high and um, had to be tackled subsequently. Um, and, and not having paying attention to those kinds of qualities produces um, real dangers. And you, you mentioned um, early on legitimacy as, a, as an issue. And uh, I, I think that's exactly right. Um, and there's a question about that, and particularly in the context of polarization and, as you say, heightened um, federalism, uh, the legitimacy of this uh, presidential institution is uh, is something that's valuable and, and and under siege. So I so I just want to I'll, I'll stop there, but just to say I think I I, I want to say that um, or I, 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 we want to argue in the book that the the institutional inheritance has become strained and um which is i think observable and measurable um, and that leads both to an analysis of why that's happened which is what i think we provide in the book and some of the implications that and then some thoughts about how, how this might be reformed if i can follow up to des's excellent point um I'd, I'd first like to also thank you mina for your wonderful comments and review and uh, political science quarterly for hosting this um, I'd like to briefly address your second and third questions in particular as well. Um, so Des has highlighted well, I think, why we focus so much on the institutional side. I'd just like to add to that and say, to be sure Trump might be an unusual character in some way, um, but it's really notable to us that, you know, he saw the unitary executive theory and was surrounded by promoters of this theory and saw it as useful to him and deployed it in a number of ways in his administration, both in a formal sense, whether that be, you know, making arguments about it, his lawyers making arguments about it, but also he understood it and, and instinctively sort of grasped it in his exercise of power. So to be sure, you know, there's his character, but he was grasping at something that's an idea that's been developed, you know, particularly in the conservative legal movement for some time. And we thought that that connection was really mm -hmm. important. Um, on the question about sort of institutional reforms, I mean, to be sure, um, that's a major question and, and prescription is hard. Um, one of the things we've been thinking about are some of the reforms that other folks have had ideas about on the party side and on the administrative side. So like on parties, for example, some scholars have written about what things like preference primaries might do to induce some collective responsibility. On the administrative side, you know, we saw the House of Representatives pass um, the Protecting Our Democracy Act, which had quite a few potential reforms like greater protections for inspectors general, uh, reforming the president's emergency powers. Um, there's proposals by scholars for, you know, reducing the number of political appointments. Um, and, there's, and there's different rationales to do that that might even benefit the president. But I want to step back from that and, and sort of emphasize two things that I think we want to draw attention to on that point about collective responsibility. Um, one is we highlight the significance, I think, of institutional creativity over time and the importance of that. And that may seem like a very basic point, but we think it's kind of important to remember in this age of constitutional formalism, when it seems like our system is talking about the founders intent all the time and the courts are you know, developing sort of a, even stricter understandings of what the separation of powers uh, means, but historically with the party system, with the administrative state, these were political actors devising creative new means to deal with you know, how to make the presidency serve more potentially collective ends. So just recognizing that as a historical tradition in our politics is important. The second thing I would say is there's a basic question that comes out of our book about whether Americans are going to value what depth has to offer or not. 
if, if we don't value what depth has to offer, stability, expertise, knowledge, et cetera, then it sort of becomes a moot question. Then maybe, you know, that's what the unitary executive might provide. If you don't value what depth has to offer, that vision is more attractive. But if we do value what depth has to offer, then that's where we can start to think about these institutional solutions. But for us, that's the sort of first critical and political question. We've seen certainly hints during the Trump presidency during the pandemic of increased recognition of the role that, you know, State Department officials played in the impeachment or that scientists played during the pandemic. And that, that's a hopeful sign. But we've also obviously seen bureaucratic sort of expertise um, denigrated by many, and that's worrying. So this political question about whether depth is going to be valued is sort of a precondition to maybe some of these institutional reforms. Mm. Uh, I'll just say um, a f just a few things. Um, you know, it's, it's um, surprising to me, you know, political science has for the for 30 years has been warning about this presidential selection system. And then suddenly we get a president who takes advantage of it and shows us exactly what these political scientists were warning us about. And then we say, oh no, it's personal. It's, a per it's just the person, right? Uh, in a sense, that was the easiest part of this book. That is to say that Trump is simply a manifestation of what we've been talking about uh, as the dangers in this selection system for 30 years. Um, I also think um, this is picking up on something that, that John just said. Part of the thing, the interesting thing to me in the book was, you know, the, the, um, the obvious response, the, if the, we, we have thought about the problem as the problem of administrative control, right? The problem of bureaucratic power, the problem of administration. And the solution is, you know, the constitutional solution. It's president, the president should control the bureaucracy. Right? But in writing this book and in thinking about the history, what we were impressed with was how um, creative, to use John's words, uh, reformers have been and Congress has been in recognizing the limits of that solution, presidential control of the bureaucracy as the solution to the problem of bureaucratic power. In our book, we don't make the bureaucrats the heroes, right? There's all sorts of uh, uh, cases in which we point out that the bureaucrats are doing pretty outrageous things in resisting Trump, right? Uh, what we want to say is that there's this a breakdown, right, of the cooperative systems of control that uh, for a long time held the system together. And this gets back to the original question about phantoms, because these phantoms, this deep state conspiracy, and this idea of a unitary executive and control of the executive, these are implicit in the constitutional frame, they're implicit in the ambiguity of who controls the bureaucracy. They're, impl they're uh, implicit in the ambiguity of what the vesting clause actually means. Right? And what we wanted to say was that for a long time, political actors were able to submerge those ambiguities in cooperative relationships to recognize presidential power to actually grant the president more power at the same time, ease up on the separation of powers and create these more cooperative administrative designs. And that's what's broken. And once those break down, then these two implicit phantoms, these two implicit uh, issues in the constitution the power of bureaucrats and the power of a unitary, somehow those suddenly become full blown uh, and they're played out in headlines every day. Uh, so I think that's what we meant by phantoms. That is, they've always been implicit. They're implicit in the ambiguities of the constitution and they haunt the shadows of the constitution. But it's when the breakdown of these cooperative arrangements it's the breakdown of these cooperative arrangements that gives flight to those phantoms. And then you see, 
right, some serious structural problems in the constitutional setup itself. Mm. Uh, serious structural problems that can only, I think, be solved by another round of institutional, not thinking that the constitution has this solved, but that it has to be solved the way it's always been solved by these uh, common carriers of new ideas about how American government should operate. Thank you. Professor Bowes, any comment or um, follow-up uh, thoughts? Uh, otherwise, I could move on to questions from the audience. Yeah, I'll just say that I, I appreciate the responses and particularly that last one, Steve, about the kind of tracing it back to the constitutional era up to the present. I think that the, the points that were raised about um, cooperative relations and, um, and the need for appreciating depth are, are, have, have really um, raised kind of the key underlying issues to address as we look at questions of reform. So I'll, I'll leave it at that, but, but thank you for those comments. Thank you. Um, uh, the questions that we have from our attendees kind of focus um, collectively on the question of solutions and the question of transition from Trump to Biden. Um, we could look first at questions related to solutions uh, one of our attendees is asking whether a uh, amendment, constitutional amendment, uh, is something that could pose a solution, or whether considering other theories like the dangers of populism and minority control of government is a different dimension that perhaps could help bring about some type of uh, so solution or answer to the question of what's next. If any of you would like to weigh in on that question. I, I think maybe the, the first thing to say with the question about um, the constitutional amendment. So, so there are some proposals that are out there for something like that, that maybe would sort of constitutionalize the administrative state, if you will, um, either the whole thing or, or particular aspects of it, like keeping the Department of Justice independent or whatnot. Um, I mean, it's an interesting idea to be sure. I think it's very symptomatic of the sort of formalist way that um, a lot of institutional uh, reforms have been thought about recently. But I would just say that um, it, that still fundamentally comes back to this, this sort of prior question about whether uh, our politics are going to value what depth has to offer. If we've gotten to a point where a constitutional amendment is possible, that would suggest that you know these values have suddenly become politically relevant and, and respected. And if we don't get to the point where they're valued and respected, then, then particularly with that threshold of change, it's, it's not going to happen. So that was why we focused on that political question in, in particular to begin with. Thank you. I mean, I uh, think, sorry. Please go right ahead. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I think John's right. I, I agree with him. I am. There, there are a lot of conundrums. Um, the, the presidency still remains this indirectly elected institution um, in a system that was designed to have indirect control and to reflect biases in the, um, in the political system. Um, and that's, that's a continuing problem. It's unlikely the Electoral College is going to be uh, reformed or abolished, however. So the, the the processes there seem to, which I, I think probably it's time to think about that. And, and there's, there's, we can see further encroachments on uh, on that process with the, um, with the with the um, pressure on on at the state level in on legislatures to agree to reforms about who can be the um, the electors um, and members of the electoral college. Um, I think the New York Times had a big piece about this on, on Sunday, reviewing different state legislatures, which is very sort of alarming and interesting. Um, the, the, there, there are some measures, however, which Congress could take. Um, it's it's, it's the, the vulnerability of the, of the um, I mean, we're not, as, as St Stephen has, has made clear, we're not just standing here sort of defending bureaucrats and saying they're all great and, and the, the rest is terrible. But, the, but the, the struggle that in the US system to try to depoliticize core parts of the civil service uh, from the Pendleton Act onwards in the 1880s through to uh, the important Carter era reforms, um, 
seem to be surprisingly vulnerable to to a, an executive who wants to return politicization. And that's what was happening at the end of the Trump years. So Congress acting on that and robustly uh, passing more robust legislation to protect those rights, um, would I think will be a, something that will be an important step um, implied by the analysis in the book. Thank you. Um, and the next set of questions from the audience center around the transition from Trump to Biden and what your thoughts are on that and whether the expanded and revised edition of your book does address that question of transition and if anything did change in the two years um, since the exit of Trump yeah. and the exit of Biden. Well, we do, we do definitely uh, address the transition in a couple of ways, and I'm, I'm sure uh, Steve and Des will each, each have something to add because there's so much that we're thinking about there, but um, maybe a couple of big points. Um, one is the way uh, in which Trump and his administration um, attempted to sort of leverage the, the unitary executive theory and the position he had created for himself to obviously um, not accept an election result. Um, and, and this might seem like an obscure example, but we think it's an illustrative one. Um, so after uh, the January 6th riot, um, Trump of course faced several lawsuits about this, including from some members of Congress uh, and the defense and response to those lawsuits um, that his legal team gave, gave are really interesting. So they allege two things um, in their briefs. One is that the idea that um, you can even sort of try to regulate a, a president's speech or allege incitement inherently would infringe on the executive power. Um, that's a novel argument, I think, but that's one that they make. Um, and the second is that the president as head of the executive branch has the right to sort of order the Department of Justice to check whether election results were valid or legitimate or not. So to be sure this is a legal brief now issued you know, in response to a lawsuit, he's not the president, but you see there again, it's not a coincidence that they keep returning to this theory and there they're deploying it to an anti-democratic end. Um, so that was one particular element of the transition that was striking to us. Uh, the second that I'll just mention is that Steve touched on in his opening remarks is the degree to which you know, the response of the Biden administration is personal and sort of involves choices about self-restraint. So there's a lot of areas in which he's ostensibly exercised self-restraint, respecting the authority of scientists in many ways, respecting the authority of the EPA, the independence of the Justice Department. But we've also seen the unitary theory make some perhaps surprising advances. Now, part of that is driven by the courts, which of course have a lot of you know, new judges and justices that were appointed by Donald Trump. Um, we've seen a series of cases from the court in which they've adopted the unitary theory as, as jurisprudence. But one of the most notable things for us was when um, President Biden fired the holdover social security commissioner. I mean, we know why he wanted to, to do that, but the office of legal counsel issued an opinion basically saying, you know, we've seen the court has had these series of decisions uh, saying that these types of officials should be fireable. We're now going to extend that and think this logic applies to a new officer. And maybe the court was going to do that anyway. But that's a case of Biden not only acting on this authority from the court in a unitary manner, but his administration actually echoing those arguments and applying them to another administrative agency. Thank you. We have one more question, and this will be the final question that um, we will take from the audience. Um, and then I know there is a follow-up question from Professor Bode. Let me uh, first pose the uh, final question from the audience. Um, and then I'll come right back to you. Uh, does the concept of independent regulatory commissions contradict the concept of dignitary executive? That is a question coming from one of our attendees. Does it contradict? Uh, does the concept of independent regulatory commissions contradict the concept of the unitary executive? Ah, I see. It certainly, it certainly complicates it. Um, 
but but a lot of the commissions at the moment are um, uh, you don't have a full quota of um, of commissioners. Um, I mean, the Federal Reserve is perhaps an example of um, a um, agency which has got autonomy, um, more autonomy than the other ones. Um, but I don't think it has absolute autonomy on that basis. Steve probably wants to say something. About no, this. well, yeah. um, you know, I think this brings us back to, we always think of progressives as being <laughs> pro-president, pro-president, you know, they wanted pro powerful presidents. But in fact, when you think about progressive, they're the ones who instituted the merit civil service. They're the ones who instituted the independent regulatory commissions. They're the ones who surrounded the presidency with experts in the Bureau of the Budget uh, and, and the National Security Council. The progressives wanted a stronger president, we think, uh, at least what we say, the, president, the, the progressives understanding of a stronger president was kind of a national agenda setter. It was kind of a legislative leader, very much kind of Woodrow Wilson uh, set the national agenda. But, uh, the others, but in empowering the presidents in that way, the progressives were very concerned to insulate the administrative arm of government mm -hmm. from uh, direct presidential control. And they did that in all sorts. And then and not only that, but to surround the president with these experts so that the decisions he, were, he was making were informed uh, by people that they thought had knowledge-based authority. So uh, yes, I think that the independent commissions run directly against the independent com uh, the uh, unitary executive and purposefully so because the progressives were not into a unitary executive. This is, a, this is an idea that has spun out since the Reagan administration really uh, as very much uh, a counter to the progressives idea of administration, which is a kind of insulated arm. Uh, and very much, I think, at odds with the progressives understanding of political leadership, which is basically legislative leadership. Uh, whereas in the unitary view, presidents exercise leadership through control of the bureaucracy, through control of administration. Thank you. Thank you very much. Professor Bose, if you'd like to pose the final thoughts and questions that you, that you may have. Thank you. Yes, this will be very quick. Um, Desmond referred in this discussion to institutional fragility, and that clearly requires an institutional response. John referred to Americans valuing depth, and Steve referred to cooperative relations breaking down. It seems to me that those last two points, getting the public to value depth and rebuilding cooperative relations requires a personal response, perhaps as much as if not more, if not overridingly, um, more so than an institutional response. And so I'm just, I, I just wonder if, if you would share some concluding thoughts on, on how we balance the the institutional and the individual in addressing these problems? Because it seems to me that those two challenges, I don't see how institutional reform alone can address them. Thank you. Well, I'll start and then John and Steve come in. I mean, I, I think if we look historically, the, the response to uh, the Roosevelt presidency and the creation, you know, the president needs help. Um, was a set of institutional packages, arrangements put into place, which did, um, uh, which were independent of the personal. I, I, th I think your comment is astute and well done. And but that's one that's one example where the the uh, reforms came through in a fairly in, a, in an institutional sort of um, um, uh, style response. I think. Um, I, I'm, I'm sure you're right that lots of presidents have tried to um, exercise change by leadership. I mean, that's the, the part of the reason why they become presidents to try and do it there. So I, I would agree with you that it's possible also for um, um, uh, well-primed, well-placed uh, presidents to, um, to mobilize for change. I'll stop there.
think to to echo Des and and to bring back up a, a point that that Steve made before, um, to be sure there's there's a role for for leadership in this. And if that leadership happens to come from from a president, that would be great. I think our our caution is that even even presidents that you know may promise self restraint, we we should have at least some some healthy skepticism about that, um, particularly when they're picking and choosing sort of where where they are going to exercise that self restraint versus pursue power. And so when we think of it as an institutional response, um, I mean historically on the administrative side. Um, you know, there's there's always been a major role for Congress in sort of structuring the executive branch, and in fact, you know, enlisting the president for certain ends. The president's role as uh, such a legislative agenda setter was partly set in you know statutes between the 1920s and the, and the 1940s. So um, again, there's a role for the president to play in that, but but Congress responding to it and sort of, you know, them thinking creatively about what to do strikes us as at least one of those kinds of paths towards, towards institutional reform. Um, to be sure in our current environment, we have concerns about, you know, how the courts would view some of what Congress could do, but congressional creativity has been a big part of this story. I'll just say, um, uh, oh couple of things about um, the personal. Um, I think, you know, it's striking to us, you know, think about uh, in the nuts and bolts of the Biden presidency, Biden promised self-restraint and you can point to various things of the Justice Department. Now we complain that uh, the, the attorney general is running the Justice Department like a court and he's not political enough, right? Uh, but I think about the Biden, uh, for all his respect for administrative depth, just overruled the generals in the in the uh, withdrawal from Afghanistan. He just sort of, you know, and he paid the price for that. Uh, Biden has not, the Biden administration, at least last time we checked, has not resisted the Trump, what, what I see is one of the nuts and bolts, uh, 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 most serious assaults on death where the Trump administration uh, 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 eliminated uh, the insulation for the administrative law judges and made the administrative law judges subject to political dismissal and perhaps political appointment. The Biden administration hasn't reversed that. In fact, the Biden administration uh, has used those similar arguments uh, to apply to other aspects of uh, administrative installation. So, you know, I can't think of two, two people more diametrically opposed in their dispositions toward bureaucracy than Biden and Trump, but the institutional incentives in the presidency are such that we can't look to the president to solve this problem. Uh, and in fact, if you look historically, presidents have never solved this problem. The solution has come, as John says, from Congress, and it's come from uh, uh, reformers who have somehow convinced the country <laughs> that uh, alternative governing arrangements are attractive and that presidential control is not the only way to control a bureaucracy. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, this concludes we're reaching the very end of our session. And um, I think we could have stayed on this screen for many, many more hours um, discussing and thinking and trying to just identify solutions to um, a, a very big challenge. Um, I hope that we will have the opportunity to do it again. I thank you all for participating in this forum. Thank you, Professor Rose, for your review article. And thank you to the three authors of this fantastic book uh, for your scholarship. And we all look forward to seeing the revised and expanded edition of your book. Um, you. You're very welcome. Thank you to all our members of the audience. Uh, we do hope that they enjoyed this conversation as much as we all did. I wish you all well, and I hope to see you again very soon. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you so much. Thank you very much.